Hi lacrosse fans, welcome back to episode number 29 of the Sticks and Picks lacrosse podcast presented by Lacrosse Unlimited. Lacrosse Unlimited has provided the best equipment, apparel, and lacrosse footwear since 1990. Be sure to check out their website at lacrosseunlimited.com. I'm your host, Will Pechnig, alongside co-host Jake Fox. In today's episode, we talk to one of the National Lacrosse League's best Twitter personalities and top players, Curtis Dixon. He talks about representing Team Canada and how special those events have been for him. He shares some great stories about his lacrosse career to date and everything he has been up to lately. We're extremely excited to welcome a two-time All-American from the University of Delaware, where he led the program to their only Final Four appearance and is the school's all-time leading goal scorer. He's a product of British Columbia minor lacrosse. He has won a Man Cup with the Peterborough Lakers. He's an NLL champion with the Calgary Roughnecks. He's won multiple gold medals with Team Canada in box and field lacrosse. He's been named an All-World and All-Pro member several times. He currently plays for the Calgary Roughnecks of the National Lacrosse League and the Chaos Lacrosse Club of the PLL. We're pleased to welcome Curtis Dixon. Fellas, thanks for having me. Yeah, we like to, uh, you know, butter you up a little bit before we get That's, That was fantastic. Thank you. You can keep going. Oh, it's definitely a great resume. We're excited to have you, so we'll dive right into things here and ask you how you got involved in the game of lacrosse. Uh, it was family, right in the family. My dad, he grew up playing um, lacrosse in Vancouver. All my cousins uh, played as well. They're older than me, so I was always you know, going out to their games when they were playing out west here, Senior A. And, um, you know, my dad basically put a stick in my hands, you know, as soon as I was born. I was playing organized lacrosse when I was, I think, three years old. And, um, you know, the rest is kind of history. Uh, growing up, was your, I'm assuming with your dad's history, was he your coach a lot growing up? Or who were some uh, of Yeah, fair, fair amount when I was when I was super young, like, you know, Pete, novice and mini tyke he was he was helping out but he always he kind of stepped back he was never um super into that he always i mean we'd go to the box and, and play catch and whatever else basically every day but um i remember kurt Malosky, my coach in calgary now was my coach in peewee and i'll say he coaches basically the same way with peewee kids as he does with pro guys so it was very intimidating as a however old you are in peewee 10 11 year old kid, uh, you know, having Kurt Malosky yell in your face. But uh, that was probably honestly one of the most fun seasons I had in my career. We won the gold medal in, in BC here, and I think we only lost you know, three or four games that year. So it was uh, it was an eye opening having Kurt as a coach, but it was it was awesome. So I'm assuming going back to that, he's probably one of the coaches that had a huge influence on you growing up. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, he's like I said, he was one of my coaches, obviously in Pee Wee, and then um, obviously, you know, all the way through my, my career with Calgary and um, you know, he's, he's phenomenal. He's, I don't know. I don't know if there's another coach in the world that, you know, knows X's and O's like that guy. And he's um, in my opinion, the best of what he does. And you know, we're lucky to have him in Calgary. And um, it was nice to you know be able to win one for him last year, knowing how passionate he is. I mean, nobody in, you know cares more than that guy and, and wants to win more than that guy. So that was uh, that was big for him to get that and for us to get it for him. Looking back now, uh, when you see BC minor now compared to how it uh, was when you played, what are some of the big changes you've noticed or some of the, I don't know, maybe it's skill, maybe it's whatever. What's some of the big uh, differences you've noticed in BC minor? Yeah, I mean, you see some of the, the products that, you know, BC's turning out these days. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty incredible seeing all the, you know, the kids working their way through the, the BC minor system and then going off to school and then doing the whole scholarship route. So uh, it's awesome to see. It's, it's grown you know, monumentally since I've been there, it was, you know, just a few teams, uh, you know, competing for that you know, gold medal every year. And, and now you see, you know, the Langleys and the Maple Ridges of the world, um, you know, up near the top with, you know, their, their uh, you know, the numbers they have in, in their minor associations growing every year. So it's pretty cool to see uh, the growth that's you know happened over the last uh, 20 years, I guess now, since I've been playing minor because I'm an old man, but um, no, it's, it's good to see. It's, it's awesome. You're not that old, but uh, yeah, it, it is great to see the growth of the game and uh, it's going to be special to see in the next 20 years where the game will be at. So uh, you did grow up in Port, Co- 
Coquitlam and you ended up playing junior there as well. Can you kind of talk about playing for your hometown junior team and then uh, what the jump was like for you coming out of midget lacrosse, I guess it was? Yeah, I played. So, yeah, I was right out of midget. I skipped. We have obviously intermediate, or we did have intermediate here in, in BC for, for guys coming out of you know, midget to play a couple years there before going to junior. But I skipped over intermediate and, and went straight to junior. And um, it was awesome. Like I said, with my dad growing up, watching him or watching my cousins, I, you know, I'd go to the Saints Junior A games, you know, at the Poco Arena growing up and, and watching those games and, um, you know, being able to play. With some of those guys I looked up to with, you know, Robbie Van Beek and a lot of those Poco legends, it was, uh, it was awesome. And it was, it was eye-opening getting to, you know, coming straight out of midget as a, you know, 16, 17-year-old kid hopping in playing junior A was, was, uh, it was tough. It was, it was, a, it was a tough transition, but um, it was, I think, made me a better player for um, going through that and you know, playing against those high-level guys at such a young age. And um, it was, uh it was cool. And then obviously I played three years in Poco and um, going into my fourth season, you know, a bunch of us were kind of, you know, didn't see eye to eye with our, our GM at, in Poco at the time. And um, a couple of us wanted to get traded and, you know, go have a chance to play for somebody that had a, you know, a chance of winning and, and, and competing. And um, he didn't see the same way that we did. So uh, a bunch of us decided to sit out and he, Basically sat us out the entire summer, and then a trade deadline rolled around, and he said, okay, I'm going to you know, ship you guys out now. And my one buddy said, okay, he went to Coquitlam. And uh, back then they had a, a rule. you could If you sat out an entire year, you, you became a free agent and could play wherever you want the next season. So I just really wanted to stick it to him. So I, uh, I just said, no, I'm going to sit out the rest of the summer, and I'm going to do whatever I want next year. So you're not going to get anything for me. And that's the way it went. And... I ended up going playing for the the Bellies, New West, my my last year junior, and um, had a decent run with them, but had some injury troubles late in the season, and ultimately lost to Coquitlam in the in the BC finals in six games. But I uh, don't regret my decision at all. I love playing for New West. That was where my dad played his, his senior lacrosse for the Bellies. So getting to you know play for that organization in that arena was was pretty special. So two questions came out of that. The first one I was going to ask, what are your thoughts about, because Ontario BC difference from you have to play basically intermediate for BC for the most part, unless obviously someone comes around where they believe they can make the jump where Ontario, you got A, B, C, junior. And then the other one was um, this free agent rule, which I actually didn't know that, which is kind of interesting that differs from Ontario too. Um, so kind of, your thoughts on both those and I know obviously one worked out really well for you so <laughs> yeah well they both did uh no well they got rid of intermediate now I think a few I don't know how long ago it might have been three or four years ago they scrapped intermediate so BC's five years of junior now as well so I don't think we have any junior C I know we have obviously junior B and junior A so I think that was a, a step in the right direction for them for sure following the, the Ontario model and, and like I said just getting the getting those kids playing against higher competition and doing the five years of junior. So, you know, we like a, BC's made that change and I think that's for the better. And um, as for that rule, I don't think, I'm pretty sure that's gone. I know they, um, they scrapped it. I know there was a few guys in senior. There was one year, uh, I don't know if it was Alex Geich or somebody got drafted first and sat out a year and um, switched teams. And then I think they switched the rule. It's, you got to sit out for like five years or something. They just made it something outrageous. So, guys weren't allowed to do it anymore so um it worked in my favor for for that year um but it was pretty shortly after that that the rule got changed so i don't think guys can do that anymore no well i know you're not one to kind of brag but you know we'll we'll state this two-time first team all-star one-time second team all-star your whole junior career you're in top 10 scoring in the league um so i mean it worked out pretty nicely and pretty uh solid junior career i'd say yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was awesome. Like I said, getting I don't regret my time playing in Poco. I love playing for for Poco, and you know Jerry Van Beek was was my coach there for a number of years, and he's awesome. And you know I still talk to him to this day. And um, it was uh, yeah, it was a uh, it was unfortunate that I had to you know miss a year and only have four years of junior, but that's just the way she goes sometimes, and had to make some sacrifices to better my career in the long run so but no like I said I got no regrets and, and I had a pretty decent junior career yeah 
Yeah, certainly. Junior is usually the the best time of all our lives when we're playing sports. So um, we're going to have some fun here. Uh, we're going to do a teammate challenge. So Jake's going to give you a couple of questions here. You got to think of a teammate who first comes to mind. You can explain uh, why you think the teammate best fits it, fits that uh, question, or you don't have to. It's completely up to all you. All right, first one. First is the worst style on the floor and then off the floor. Uh, I'm probably going to be the same guy for both. I got to go with Dane Doby. He's, uh, he just has the, I don't give a shit attitude and that's what I love about him. But I remember God, a few years ago, he, um, I mean, he always wore the same old ratty suit. And I remember Jeff Snyder and had, had a couple of hand-me-down suits that he gave him. And I don't know if you know, I mean, Jeff Snyder's a fairly stocky guy and a little bit taller than Dane and Dane never bothered to go get them tailored or anything so he was just swimming in these suits and Dave's a pretty good big guy too obviously but he uh he yeah he was they were a little bit large on him and he's like again he just he didn't give a shit he was he showed up to the rink and, and scores six goals and wearing the you know the worst suit in the league but um he's uh he's he's definitely my candidate for for, for worse dress that's for sure uh least favorite matchup box and field Least favorite matchup, like on the floor. Yeah. So go like against. Guy, yeah, to go against. So one guy. From uh, one. box is pretty easy. I'll go with Graham Hossick. He's an animal. He's strong as a goddamn ox, and he's just so so damn good at what he does. Isn't in my opinion, he's the best lacrosse player in the world right now, all around. He's he's a he's a very good player. And field. Oh man, I don't know. I mean, I played against some. Pretty damn good players last week. I'm trying to think of Matt Dunn was a good player playing for the Whip Snakes. I mean, so many guys in that league are so good. It didn't really matter. The one, two, and three guy were all, you know, all world players. So it was, uh, you know, getting getting to play against those, you know, that uh, that type of competition all you know, the last few weeks was was pretty awesome. Uh, teammate most likely to become uh, the president or prime minister. Ooh. Uh, Man, I mean, he's already has a better job than that, but I'd go with Curtis Manning. He's handsome, handsome devil, smartest guy I know. He's a doctor, so he's, like I said, he's probably not going to quit that to become the Prime Minister of Canada. But if uh, if anybody on our team were to do it, I'd, I'd, put, I'd pick Mano. Uh, biggest prankster? Oh, prankster, no longer on the team, but probably Greggy Harnett. He's a, he's a shithead. And I love him to death for it. He's he's always just doing dumb shit and, and messing around with people. So I'd say Greggy. I'm interested to hear this one. Biggest internet tough guy. Oh, biggest internet tough guy? Man, I don't like we don't have not a lot. We, we're not a big social media team. Like not a lot of our guys are super active. I don't know. I'd say me, I guess, by default. Because <laughs> I'm an asshole on Twitter sometimes, and I like to act tough, so I'll, I'll go with myself. Uh, best roommate you've had? Oh, I got to go dopes. Oh, that's tough. Danny Mac. Danny McRae was my roommate for, God, you know, six, seven years in the league. And, um, you know, we started the whole mega bed trend and, and pushing our beds together and, and sleeping together. So I got to go Danny Mac and an honorable, honorable mention to dopes. Um. Who's a guy who would be a really good coach if they decided to go that way? Uh, Dobbs. Dane Dobby. He's, I've, uh, you know, been able to run some stuff with him. And, and we started up a company out here. And um, he coached uh, junior in, in, in Alberta. And I know he coached the, the Alberta Midget National Team to a, to a gold medal that kind of shocked a lot of people. And, and not a lot of people saw them as, you know, even being competitive in that tournament. So he's, uh, he's very good. Very good, like similar to Kurt, you know, the X's and O's and just his knowledge of the game and, um, you know, being able to put the pen to paper and really, you know, teach guys, you know, the proper way to play. So I'd, I'd go with Dobbs. Uh, best athlete you've ever played with? Best athlete I've ever played with. Oh, that's tough too. Um, I don't know, Zach, I guess, Courier. He's just, I mean, he's a young Brody Merrill. He does, does it all. He seems like he plays about 59 minutes a game and 
Um, not the biggest guy, not the strongest guy in the world, but he's a, he's a, he's a pretty decent athlete. So I'll give it to Zach. Uh, toughest player you ever played with. Uh, I hate to pump his tires, but I got to give that to Snides. Jeff Snyder. He was, you know, getting the come in the league and, and play with that guy and just, you know, see the, the, the fear that he struck in people's eyes and just his, his presence on the floor and his demeanor. Um, you know, there's not a lot of, not a lot of guys that could, you know, stand toe to toe with that guy. Uh, best locker room DJ. Best locker room DJ. Uh, last couple of years, it's been Mitch Wild, and he's he's pretty good. So you know what, Mitch, I'll I'll give you your your 15 seconds of fame here, and I'll I'll give that one to you, Boxy. Uh, in the most endearing way, biggest jackass you've ever played with. Biggest jackass I've ever played with. I mean, there's a couple, and then I've already mentioned their names, both, but I'll say them again. Probably Jeff Snyder and Greg Harnett. I played, I don't think I ever played against Jeff, but I played against Greg in summer lacrosse, and he's an asshole. He's a dink, and just one of those guys that you hate to play against, but you love to have on your team. So I'll give those, uh, I'll give those, those guys both co, uh, co-assholes. And lastly, best and worst Twitter game. Man, like I said, not a lot of guys are super active on social media. But This can go back to, like, guys who you're still friends with from Delaware and stuff like that, too. It doesn't have to be a whole um, lot. Yeah, those guys aren't so or much either. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of who's good on Twitter that I've played with. Best social I mean, media guys- in the NLL, then. Go with that. Best social media in the NLL. Uh, I don't know. You guys talked about Othello. I think he's he's funny. He's got his his rankings and his lists and his negative Thursdays and positive Fridays and all that stupid shit that he does. That always kind of makes me chuckle. So I'll uh, I'll give kudos to I'll give kudos to Nick and and give him that one. All right, sorry, I got one more. I forgot to mention we uh we have Christian coming on later. So one word to describe Christian Del Bianco. <laughs> Annoying. <laughs> oh, no, I'm kidding, Delves. I love you, buddy. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, well, well, I'm sure he'll get you back in, in a oh, little he, bit he here. Definitely will. You won't even have to ask him to. He'll just do it. We're we're gonna jump to your uh, field lacrosse here. Kind of go through your recruiting process and what BC field lacrosse was like uh, when you decided to commit to Delaware. Yeah, BC field was. I mean, pretty non-existent back in you know early 2000s when I was kind of going through middle and high school um, you know the field lacrosse scene was basically just box on grass it was time to you know keep your stick in your hand in the in the box across off season so um, not a lot of structure and not you know no programs or travel teams or anything like there are today and uh, my recruiting process I played in a couple nationals I think one was one was in Manitoba and I know um, Dartmouth um recruited me they were they were talking to me and um jordan hall who's you know still playing in the nll now he was a senior at delaware my my first year there and he uh and i played against him in, in junior he was playing in surrey and he kind of you know him and his dad kind of reached out to me and asked me if you know i was in, in any interest in, in heading to delaware and um i know i went did a visit and, and stayed with him there and it was unbelievable and um you know i was still talking to dartmouth at the time and did the whole uh you know sat thing and and i know dartmouth you know called me back and or delaware called me and said yeah we'd love to have you and, and dartmouth called me and said hey was we're gonna need you to retake your sats and, and get your scores up so i you know called delaware back and said looks like i'm coming to delaware so i uh it was uh, it was honestly uh, between two teams and if it wasn't for jordan God, no, I might not have even, you know, went to school. I would have been gone, you know, played D2 or D3 somewhere. So um, it was pretty non-existent, especially for the West Coast guys back there. I know Billings Billings went to Virginia and, and obviously Crowley uh, and McBride went to Stony Brook. But other than that, you know, there was maybe a handful of guys, you know, at that time that were from out West, you know, playing in D1 schools on the East Coast. So it was, uh, I kind of lucked out and thank, you know, to obviously thank Jordan and his dad for, Getting me out to Delaware and, and putting me in touch with that co- with, with Coach Schillinglaw there and um, obviously the rest is history. Delaware was 
unbelievable, unbelievable four years. Um, you know, anybody that's gone and, and played, you know, across at, at uh, you know any level on, on scholarship in the states can tell you that it's you know four of the four or five of the best years of your life, and uh, don't regret any of it. Your freshman year, you showed up, uh, played right away. You know, became an impact player right away. Um, from coming from little field experience, like you said, basically playing box on a field. Uh, what were some of the big um, adjustments you had to make showing up on campus? Yeah, I actually didn't play right away. It was funny. I, I started at midfield and um, first half of the season, I basically sat on the bench and I think I got into, you know, a game or two um, in the blowouts at the end of the games um, in the freshman year, my freshman year there and uh, basically playing scout team the whole first half of the season. And then, um, you know, our, our assistant coach at the time, Chris Collins, who's, who was a Drexel and who's coaching the, uh, the Redwoods in, in the PLL this summer. He was a Delaware and he's, you know, basically pumping my tires, telling coach to give me a chance and, and you know, put me on the field. And we had an injury at attack uh, about halfway through the year and, and they needed a body to fill in. So um, coach said, screw it, you know, put this stupid Canadian that can only play with one hand and, and chuck him in there and see what he can do. And um, the rest is history. You know, I played, I started every game from then on out and um, kind of lucked out and, you know, you never want to wish injury upon anybody, but that was kind of my stepping stone and my, you know, my, my kind of big break to, to, to crack the lineup. And um, yeah, it was, it was tough. It was tough, you know, obviously growing up being, you know, one of, if not the best player on your team, you know, anywhere you play and then kind of going into that environment and, um, you know, sitting on the bench, it was, it was, it was a bit of a shock, but uh, like I said, I had never really played field before. Obviously I was, very one dimensional, not being able to use my off hand and um, me playing defense, you know, in field, nobody wants or needs to see that. So that was, I was a big liability at that aspect as well. So once they figured they could, once they figured out they could plug me in, plug me in an attack and keep me off the other end of the field, I think that's when they, you know, they learned they could keep me on the field. Hey, be thankful it was half a season, not four years. Um, <laughs> uh, you guys, one thing that's really cool is you were part of the only Final Four team in Delaware history. Um, and uh, there's obviously a bunch of guys. Obviously, John Graham Jr. is one that comes up as one of the best players to go there, and you're right there with them. Uh, what made that Final Four team so special compared to, you think, other teams that were, you know, didn't quite make that jump? Yeah, it was crazy. It was, you know, we kind of sputtered through the regular season, you know, on and off. Um, we had Alex Smith, which was massive. He was that was back before, you know, the whole face-off specialty position really existed. Not a lot of teams had the true FOGO. And, um, you know, he set every single face-off record in the NCAA before, um, you know, I think whoever Baptiste now owns them all. But um, he uh, he was massive. And it just – it's – honestly, it's it was very similar to our Calgary team last year when we won the championship. It's just about playing – good lacrosse at the right time and, and we went into the CAA tournament and um, kind of, you know, just played well and, and got that automatic, automatic bid um, into the championship, uh, into the, you know, the NCAA tournament and kind of we drew for Virginia in the first round there and they were the defending champions and you know, everybody kind of wrote us, wrote us off and we just played that underdog role and we kind of thumped them. I think it was 14-8 was the final score. We, we jumped out early on them and um, that was – Pretty cool. I think they were the two seed that year, the two or the three seed. So, um, you know, getting to do that, go to Clockner Stadium and on on the SPN and and um, kind of spank them in, in their on their home field and, and take out the defending champions like that was was pretty cool. And then uh, I remember UMBC actually upset Maryland uh, on the other side of the bracket. So we ended up playing UMBC in the in the quarterfinals and beat them. They were good. They had a good team. They had um, uh, who did they have? Westervelt was on that team, and you know, a lot of a lot of other guys. So that was you know we went to Navy Stadium and, and beat those guys and had a chance to to play in the Final Four at, at M&T Bank, and that was unbelievable. I think it's still to this day the most attended Final Four in history. It was fifty two thousand people or something. So um, that was pretty incredible. Coming you know kid coming from Poco playing in front of ten people at the you know Poco Rec Center going to Play in front of 52,000 people at MT Bank was uh, was pretty cool, and then you know we got our 
he got her butts kicked by Hopkins. I think it was eight three in the in the semis, putting up three goals in a in the semifinal game was a little underwhelming and a and a tough end of that season. But uh, just you know, making it that far was was pretty special for us. Um, you look back, obviously, uh, you were recently, I think a couple of years ago, named to the Hall of Fame, right, for Delaware Athletics. Your all time leading goal scorer there. You were one of the few, or if not the only, Twarton finalists. Uh, you made top five. You're, um, what made Delaware so special for you, uh, looking back at it all now, and obviously all the accolades of your name being part of their history? Yeah, like I talked about before, just even the process of getting there. You know, they're the only school that really gave me a look, and um, they had faith in me. And, um, you know, obviously you'd like to be able to go compete for a national championship every, every year and play for, you know, the Syracuses or, you know, the Virginias of the world. But, um, you know, going to a smaller school and just anyone that plays at, you know, a high level of any sport, just, you know, the friendships that you make and the, the bonds that you create. And um, anybody that's been to Delaware can tell you how fun that school is. And the party scene's great outside of lacrosse. And um, just, you know, those guys that I got to play with and, you know, the runs that we went on and, you know, we made our the tournament my senior year as well. And, you know, the same thing got hot at the end of the year. And, um, you know, one of my good friends, goalie at the time, Noah Fosner's mom passed away at the end of the season. And um, just how we banded together and, and, you know, won the CAAs and did it all for her that year. So it was, it's, it was pretty special. And, you know, getting to do it with the same guys all four years, at, you know, at a smaller school like Delaware, uh, being able to do that for them was, was awesome. Yeah, no, certainly. And uh, yeah, that, that's an experience that will last with you for a lifetime making that final four. So we're going to jump back to uh, box across here. We're going to talk about your summer game. Um, you were lucky enough to play as a junior in some senior games out West. Um, what was that experience like playing in uh, senior A games uh, for, I believe you played with New West um, when you're a junior age player? Yeah, it was pretty intimidating, you know, going against grown men when you're you know, however old, 17, 18 years old, uh, playing up. But again, I talked about it before and I, you know, talked about coming out of midget and playing, playing, uh, you know, junior A when you get to kind of test yourself against the, the skill level of, you know, the best players in the world. It was kind of invaluable experience and um, getting to do it with a team like New West at the time with, you know, some of the guys they had on their team that was, you know, Ethan, I knew she was there in, in his prime and, um, you know, a lot of other guys, getting to, you know, guys that you grew up, you know, watching and, and uh, idolizing you to kind of step on the floor and play with them. So that was, uh, that was pretty special getting to, you know, hop into, hop into some of those games. Now, were you drafted by Maple Ridge after? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. you got drafted by Maple Ridge, obviously with the exception of a couple of years, you play with them your whole senior career. What's that been like for you? What's the Maple Ridge mean for you? You guys have made a couple of runs. You guys have had some really good teams. Yeah, it's, it was, it's, you know, it's, it was awesome to see, you know, how much that franchise grew over the years. And when I first got drafted there, um, you know, we, our teams, we struggled. That was during the new West and the, and the Langley dynasty days. And, you know, they'd, they'd dump us around and, you know, we'd be getting, you know, three, four wins a year and struggling, but um, you know, we drafted well, obviously picked up a lot of very good players, Frankie and net and Benny Mack and, and the list goes on. And, um, you know, the, the ownership there and then the coaching staff in Maple Ridge, uh, you know, put a lot of time and effort into to building that franchise into a, a competitor. And um, I love my time in Maple Ridge. That, uh, that organization's awesome. And, and everybody likes to rag on them and make fun of their bar in the barn. It's, it's a dump. And, you know, I'll admit it, the barn is definitely a dump. But um, it was, uh, you, know, this, you know, whatever it was, six or seven summers that I, that I played there were, were awesome and um, just, you know, seeing how far we came and getting to, you know, go play in a man cup with those guys winning out West uh, with that team was, was pretty special. And the big news came of you getting uh, a chance to come out East and playing for the Lakers uh, where, you know, that's where I got to meet you. I was playing junior at the time and played up a few games with you. Um, what was your initial thought of Peterborough when you first got there? Uh, my dad warned me. He he'd been out there playing. He played in a couple of Mintos in, in Peterborough. So he, uh, although that was you know back in the 
sixties and seventies, whenever he played in their seventies, when he played in junior. So I'm sure the, I, I figured the town had, had prospered a little bit since then, but um, didn't know what to expect. Honestly, obviously, you know, playing with Shawnee and he's kind of the one that talked me into it. Um, kind of gave me the heads up and uh, you know, getting out there. It's, it's crazy, man. Like that, you play for the Lakers. You're basically, you know, you're a minor celebrity in that city and it's uh, it's, it's a summer ball experience like, like nowhere else. You ended up winning a uh, man with them as well. Talk about that experience for you. Yeah, that was, that was fantastic. Uh, obviously 2015, my first summer there we came up short. You know, we won out East and against six nations in the finals and then went out West to play against a very stacked, very good Victoria team. And, um, I know they had steamrolled the West and, you know, we had played a, a pretty tough seven game series against six nations and then traveling out there. Um, we lost to, to Victoria in six games. So that was pretty disappointing, but, um, and then I you know told my growing the, the following summer. So I was unable to, to get back out in, in 2016, but 2017, I came back and, um, obviously made it through the East and, and got to go back to my old stomping grounds and in, in new West and my junior days there. And, uh, playing a man cup in Queens, you know, historic Queens park arena. And that was, that was pretty cool. Um, you know, they selling out that arena and, and, you know, playing in front of those fans and playing for a man cup and, and you know, how passionate that city is about the bellies when, you know, when man cup time rolls around, that was, uh, that was pretty awesome. And, um, obviously going down to buzz to start the series was a little nerve wracking for everybody, but we kind of figured our shit out and, um, or banged them after that. And, ultimately won so it was it was good i remember when that happened you kind of talking about how um special it was for you especially with your dad playing on the floor um overall that experience i know your dad was at those games too how was that for you and your dad yeah that was pretty pretty cool he uh you know he had obviously won a man cup with with new west in 81 i believe it was so um getting to you know do it in that arena um against that team you know, probably maybe a little bit tough for him having to root against the bellies, but I'm sure he didn't mind too much, um, you know, being able to see me win. So it was uh, it was pretty special for sure. After that, you go back to Maple Ridge and you end up right back in Peterborough um, playing <laughs> against Peterborough in Peterborough for the Man Cup. Uh, what was that like for you? Weird, nervous, being back at the Mem? It was honestly, yeah, a little bit of everything. I didn't know what to expect. I mean, didn't know if the fans were going to love me or hate me. And, um, you know, right off the bat, I got a, you know, a standing ovation and, uh, it was pretty cool. It was, uh, you know, it didn't take long for the fans to turn on me and, and start to hate me. I think probably about halfway through the first period of the first game, I started hearing some heckles and some boos, but, um, no, that was, that was pretty cool getting to, to, uh, you know, go back to the Memorial center and, and, um, you know, play, play against the team that, you know, I just won the man cup with last year and and in front of those fans, um, you know, like I said earlier, there's, there's not, there's nowhere else in summer lacrosse like Peterborough. It's, uh, they pack that arena and the the fans are so passionate and so knowledgeable. It's, it's an unbelievable place to play. Yeah, certainly. It's definitely uh, one of the best, I'd say summer league places to play uh, in lacrosse. So it's definitely uh, cool that you got to experience it and uh, exciting, I bet, for sure. So for, uh, you talked about uh, – uh, what was the word there? I forget it. But anyways, we're going to have fun here with our Twitter game. Uh, um, this is what I'm looking forward to the most here. Uh, basically, I'm going to read some of your tweets. You can just say no comment or you can explain uh, them. <laughs> All right. So I think guess. fans will love this. So the first one, on, yeah. in 2018, you tweeted uh, you're in love with Connor McDavid. Yeah, I mean that's I'll back that to the day I die. I'm an I'm a big Oilers guy, so he's uh, McDavid, McJesus, whatever you want to call him. He uh, he's the Lord and Savior, and unfortunately, the rest of the team stinks, so they're not going to be going anywhere anytime soon. But um, he at least makes watching Oilers games enjoyable now. So I uh, I stand by that. I love Connor McDavid. How Tough. do you think your uh, your Calgary? Your Calgary boys think about that. Oh, they don't. Actually, it's funny. Our, one of our PR people from the Flames messaged me yesterday asking if I could do a, a video kind of cheering on the Flames and having like a little good luck video to, to send out on Twitter. And I said, I, I just can't do it. I couldn't do it. There's no way. I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I did it. So That's awesome. Uh, 
Yellow Cab Vancouver is the biggest joke of a company on planet Earth. Dispatcher told me off. <laughs> Man, that was probably one of the worst nights of my life. I was downtown Vancouver and uh, probably around 10 o'clock trying to get home. Sat on hold with a cab company for a solid 45 minutes. Finally got through, ordered a cab, sat around for another half an hour, didn't show up, called back, sat on hold for another half an hour, got through, and the cab driver or the dispatcher tells me, I'm like, cab's not here. He's like, oh, you maybe have to go sit at a more highly populated street. And I said, well, what's the point of it? Isn't the point of a cab company to come pick me up where I am? Like, why do I have to, like, I gave you an address, come pick me up where I am. And he proceeds to ask me, are you telling me how to do my job? So I said, yeah, I guess so. Like, just come pick me up. Like I gave you my address, come pick me up. And then he hung up on me. So I sat there for like two hours, didn't get a cab. We don't have, we, at the time we didn't have Uber or any other means of transportation in Vancouver. So that was just a absolute nightmare of a night. And I stand by that tweet as well. <laughs> That's great. Um, you were reading replies to the Buffalo bandits Twitter account. And you said the bandits have the saltiest fans in the league. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, after last, after we beat them in the championship, I know there was some, some tweets sent out and, I remember one in particular, there was a guy that said if the Roughnecks didn't have Dane Dovey and Christian Del Bianco, you know, they wouldn't be where they are. And I said, well, of course we wouldn't. If we didn't have our leading goal scorer and our starting goalie, like, no shit. <laughs> like, what team would be if they didn't have their leading goal scorer and starting goalie, you idiot? So, they, uh, yeah, they had, some, they had some salty fans after we beat them. So, that was, it was fun going back and forth with some of them. That's awesome. Uh, another one here. Biggest airport pet peeve. Group four and five dummies lining up in the three, four, five line before they're even called. <laughs> That's, again, I'll stand by that till the day I die, too. That's people, they're, in, they're calling group one, and the people that are in group four and five just stand right in a clump, just waiting for four and five to be called. And then there's people that are in group one and two behind them, not knowing if they're in line or not. And it just creates mass nonsense when you could just move out of the way sit down wait till your gates called like it's not a race you don't have to be the first person on the plane just sit down i so i like to this day i say i want to get a job at an airport just so i can yell over the intercom for people to sit down and get them out of the way i have many pet peeves with airports but i think yeah that's that's pretty high on the list that's awesome um obviously i did a creep here and i'm gonna ask you your thoughts on champagne showers in the mlb after clinching a playoff <laughs> spot <laughs> Uh, you're going deep. I don't. I mean, that's the dumbest thing in sports. Anybody that plays any other sport at a high level can tell you. Like, I could imagine popping champagne after clenching a playoff spot, and then every time you win a round in the playoffs, you pop champagne as well. Like, if if you think that's acceptable, I don't know. I mean, it's a baseball tradition, so whatever. But I just feel like that would take away from the final celebration when you actually win the championship, and the team that loses the championship could have had like four or five champagne celebrations and lost the championship. So I just think it's stupid. Uh, and then the last one that I have, uh, what are your thoughts on the keyboard warriors of social media? Uh, you know what? They keep it entertaining. It's that's what social media is all about. As long as it's good, clean, fun, nothing is, is too out of line. Although I will say the people that have anonymous accounts, those, those people are losers. <laughs> Put your face and your name on your account. Don't be making these stupid burner accounts with cartoon character faces and Twitter egghead pictures and all that stupid shit. Put your name, put your face on it, and then you can talk all the shit you want. We brought up Nick Ocello earlier, and there's one tweet. I know you got into it with him. <laughs> I think a lot of Canadians did. When he had Gretzky third all-time, I think it was, on his greatest of all-time athletes. <laughs> and you were... <laughs> yeah, go ahead. No, I just... there's. I mean, there's not a whole lot to even say about that but he's uh, he's an american he doesn't understand so i i gotta give him the benefit of the doubt on that one they have they have fewer brain, brain cells than we do so <laughs> all right we'll go right into your nl experience now uh obviously you're 10 years into your career uh but let's go back to draft night uh what was that experience like like were you nervous teams talking to you just kind of have an idea what was it for you 
Uh, yeah, a little, a little bit of nerves. Uh, I know Boston pick two, and then Calgary obviously traded up for the third pick. Um, and didn't really know what to expect. I knew Jammer was going one. Everybody knew that to, to Rochester, so that was never really, um, you know, in the back of my mind. But um, when I saw Calgary trade up to three, I was pretty excited to have a chance to play there and, and be closer to home. So um, obviously Jammer went one, and then Boston picked uh, Rubes at two. And, um, you know, I remember just sitting at home watching on my computer and, um, back then the feed was probably cutting in and out, but, um, obviously went to Calgary at three and then, uh, funny story. Actually, I never, I didn't even, I didn't hear from the team for like two weeks after I got drafted. I didn't get a phone call from, from coach Malosky until probably two weeks later. So I didn't know any different. I thought maybe that's just standard procedure for the NLL. I heard some stories about, you know, the league not being the best and, and budgets being low. So I didn't know if anybody wanted to waste their waste their phone bill and, and, and use minutes to have to call me to, to welcome me to the, me to the team but um no i was excited it was i know calgary was coming off a championship uh, a couple of years prior to that and knew you know the talent they had in their team so that was pretty exciting for me to get to you know play that you know close ish to home with for, for a team like that i know we talked about it a little bit before but the history behind your pick is ridiculous before i told you you didn't know this the pick started with Rochester in 2008, got traded to Colorado, part of the Gary Gate trade, and got traded back to Rochester with Gavin Prout involved and Ilya Geich. And then Rochester traded to Boston for a couple picks and then ended up in Calgary for a Sanderson pick. Uh, a lot of names in there and you had no clue about this. Yeah, pretty decent lineup of, of talent there, so... But uh, that's kind of cool. I can I can chalk that up on my resume. Oh, yeah, no, I, I was, again, Swarming Up does a lot, that website. Uh, <laughs> when we look at the draft stuff, so I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, but you've played your whole 10 years in Calgary. You've stayed there, you know, and then your rookie year, you come in, you know, you said it, Jammer, Rubish. Uh, your roommate, Danny Mack, who's my captain in New York now, uh, was part of that draft there's a bunch of other guys um looking back at it who are still playing in the league um what about calgary helped you get off to that really good start in the league um i mean with the exception of the year that was cut off this year because of covid where you were averaging high points again but that was you know you haven't had lower than 50 points your entire career so what about calgary kind of helped you come into the league and uh, you know be effective right away uh yeah it's you know getting to play with some of the guys that i played with it was pretty sorry i'm opening a jar of garlic for my girlfriend here she's too weak to do it herself um <laughs> uh yeah you know what some of the guys that i obviously stepped into calgary and started playing with right away caleb toth scott ranger uh, dane Dobie, jeff Schaller, um you know all world players getting to you know have my introduction to the league playing with those guys obviously was massive um you know caleb toth in my opinion, one of the best to ever do it and often gets overlooked when, when you talk about some of the top players in the game. But um, just having those guys put me under their wing and, and obviously having Coach Kurt and, and Dave Penn was there at the time as the head coach, um, just surrounded by you know very, very smart lacrosse minds and kind of you know morphed me into the player that I am today. Uh, if you look back, you know, when I first went into the league, I was very one-dimensional, tunnel vision, some might call it, and um, just like to shoot the ball and, uh, you know, growing up, like I said before, you know, being one of the better players in your team, um, especially, you know, junior and, and minor lacrosse, that's kind of the style of lacrosse that you can play and get away with. But, you know, when you get to the pros, you know, everybody's on a different level and you got to learn to share the ball and, and, and you know, play a, a team style game. And, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to come in the league and, and play with some of those guys and, and really taught me, you know, the ins and outs of, um, I think, making me a better, you know, off ball player was, was the biggest thing. You know, I was always so used to having the ball on my stick and never, you know, had to play with it without, without it in my stick. So that was the biggest transition. And, you know, some of the biggest strides I made, you know, early in my career was, was playing off ball. When did the nickname Superman become a thing? It was pretty early in my first year, actually. I think it was Jeremy Ballantyne was the announcer in, uh, in Calgary at the time. He, uh, you know, I remember my first, 
my first goal was 16 seconds into my first game and it was a crease dive and i don't know how soon after that he coined it but he started calling me superman because i think 80 percent of the goals i scored i was just running as fast as i could towards the crease and, and diving through it and so he uh he coined the nickname i'll give him credit for that and it's just just kind of stuck ever since no, I mean, we look back at your 10 years now, obviously, you know, like I said, since your rookie year, every year except for the cutoff has been 50 plus points, 200 point plus seasons, six seasons with over 40 goals, one year you get 61. All these individual accolades combined, I can imagine the 2019 season is still probably the most special thing you've been a part of with the Roughneck. Uh, talk about that season, kind of how it ended up going, and then how it, you know, finishing off, uh, being able to raise that trophy and uh, drink some uh, some nice cold ones after. Yeah, that was it was a it was a wild year. It was a, a roller coaster year to say the least. Um, I started the season holding out. I was in contract discussions, and I missed the first four games of the season. I held out, and um, you know, lucky we were kind of able to get things figured out and. And, um, you know, the team started 3-1 without me. So, not going to lie, I was kind of hoping they would go on four and be begging me to come back and give me everything I wanted. But it was, uh, you know, no, you know, Dane Dobie that year was unbelievable. And he, he carried that team on his back and, and um, you know, got out to a good start. And then I came back and we stunk. When I first came back, I remember we got thumped by uh, New England at home. I was awful. I think I shot. I was like 0 for 14 shooting or something. And... We were just kind of, you know, on and off throughout the season, kind of just hanging around, uh, hovering around the, you know, those, those last couple of playoff spots. And then three games left in the regular season, we got Jesse King back, which was absolutely massive for us. Um, we didn't lose, we didn't lose a game once he came back in the lineup. We, we ran the table to last three or four games of the regular season, and then obviously four in a row in the playoffs. And um, again, like I, I talked about earlier with with that season and you know our final four run, it's about playing good lacrosse at the right time of year and we kind of you know just pieced everything together and you know delves his lights out in net and you know anybody that plays high level sports will tell you you're not going anywhere without a good goalie and he was uh he was phenomenal for us and um just you know the way our offense was playing the way our defense was playing you know we just kind of had that gut feeling even heading into the playoffs you know we had something special and we really had a chance to to win it all and you know we squeaked one out and in San Diego in the, in the first round. And then obviously a bit of a nail biter in the, in the semis against Colorado. It was a, w a weird game. Also it was two nothing at the half, um, you know, a, a goalie battle with Delves and Wardo and it ended up eight, four, I think we won. And then uh, obviously went and, and won two in a row against Buffalo. So it was, uh, it was, it was pretty special. And, you know, like, like you said, having been, you know, my ninth, I guess that was my ninth year in the league and, never getting to win a championship coming close one year and, and kind of going through heartbreak. So it was, uh, it was awesome getting to, you know, finally get to the end and, and win that championship and hoist that trophy. What, uh, what are you most excited? Obviously with the season being cut off short, what are you most excited going forward with Calgary here and, uh, uh, into the next season? Uh, just our youth. We've got a lot of good young players and, you know, some guys are still, kind of getting into shape and, and getting their feet wet in this league. And, um, you know, guys, you know, like Liam LeClaire, the guy, I know he played out East in, in summer lacrosse and in six nations. And not a lot of people know his name, but he's a tank. He's a beast. He's a super strong kid. And he's going to be a very good player in this league. And, um, you know, a lot of good young guys, Eli Salama and, and Reese Callies. And obviously Zach Courier is a household name, but um, a lot of really, really good young players. Hayden Dixon, another kid offensive of righty i think he was 18 years old last year he's still in junior and um he's got a lot of a lot of upside to, to his game he's going to be a very good player as well so um a lot of good young players coming up that i think are are going to be even better than you know they were last year and uh, i think the you know the future is pretty promising in calgary yeah it definitely is there's a lot of great young talent uh, in calgary and in the league as well so uh you talked about upside there um the PLL, there's lots of upside with that. Uh, you were fortunate enough to be picked up by the chaos in year one, but you didn't play. Um, was it, I think it was firefighter training or box across. What held you out there? No, it was, I got hurt. I hurt my wrist in the, in the second game of, of the, uh, the championship against Buffalo. And 
basically just kind of held me out for, for most of the summer. And then by the time I got back into being ready to play, it was kind of too deep into, into the season for them. And, you know, they had already kind of had their roster sets. So I talked to the coach. Coach Towers is awesome. I basically talked to him, you know, a couple of times a week throughout the summer and asking me if I was going to be back. And, um, you know, he knew I understood that they couldn't really just, you know, their team was, was, was playing well and they didn't want to just plug me in kind of out of nowhere and, um, that late in the year. So um, I knew he was still interested in having me for this summer. So it was uh, it was a lot of fun to, you know, even even watching the first summer not being a part of it was uh, pretty cool. Well, but you obviously, you know, you were just part of the championship series on, what was it, PLO Island, PLO Bubble? I forget what you got. Yeah, it's all the above. I think you can call it whatever the heck you want to. Uh, what was that experience like for you? Obviously, you're in quarantine at home right now, obviously with the Canadian laws and everything. So what was that whole experience like for you now? It was super cool. They, uh, you know, everything was done very, very well. Um, from, you know, we all got tested before we went. You had to, they sent us a, a test kit to everybody's house and you had to spit in the jar and, and mail it in and, and get cleared to, to travel before you even left. And uh, got tested as soon as we got there. We had to sit in our hotel rooms for 24 hours until those results came back. And then um, just everything from, you know, the accommodations to the food, to the facilities uh, was, was first class. It was, we played at the, uh, the Zions Bank Academy. It's a, I think it's a soccer academy in Utah for like a high school and the facility there is unbelievable. Um, they had the, you know, the cafeteria staff was making unbelievable meals for us, you know, two, three times a day. And, um, getting you know bus back and forth between the hotel and, and the fields and um, it was uh, it was a pretty cool experience they they did it the right way and you know obviously everything turned out great and uh, everyone kind of you know everyone obviously got home safe and healthy and um, you know it's good on them for for being able to pull that off. Let's talk about the gameplay. You guys had a really rough start, I think uh, most would say in round robin, uh, not winning a game and then going to the playoffs uh, with the seeding and making the championship. Uh, what was the big thing that changed for you guys uh, once playoff time came around? Yeah, it was, it was weird. It just, we couldn't get, we just couldn't find that mojo offensively. Our defense and obviously blaze was unbelievable throughout the whole tournament. Um, offensively, we just never really found our rhythm. And I think once coach, kind of split up the, the midfield units to have our quote unquote, you know, American and, and Canadian lines where, um, you know, our second line midfield, we ran a lot more, you know, box style offense with, with pick and rolls off the wings. And, and we kind of threw a bit of a wrinkle. We had that offense set up. Uh, we were running it in training camp, but I guess they just, they kept, they wanted to save it for, for playoff time, which thankfully they did. Obviously it worked, but um, you know, we knew going in like obviously after a couple of games that, round robin didn't really matter all that much uh everyone made playoffs so it's not like we we're sandbagging and not trying but we you know in the back of your minds we knew there were some things that we could kind of hold off with and, and keep in our back pocket for for the elimination round so it was uh it was frustrating you know anybody anybody will tell you nobody likes to lose and you know we didn't want to go on four and we didn't like going on four but at the end of the day we knew everybody had the same opportunity to to make that championship game and we just had to be you know, playing playing well at the right time, um, and you know, going into that Chrome game, we had a lot of confidence in ourselves, uh, knowing that not a lot of people had confidence in us. So it, uh, you know, everything kind of came together at the right time, and, and we were able to go on a bit of a run. Uh, you could definitely see the box influence. Obviously, yourself, Josh Byrne, Dane Smith, Audi Stats. I know I'm probably missing a couple there. You guys obviously took over that. And made a nice run at the end. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about is Andy Towers, the coach, because dude is literally when you look at PLL is just a walking soundboard for the, for the league. He's so energetic. And uh, what's he like as a coach? And what's your experience been like with uh, Coach Towers? He's the best. He's a beauty. He's I mean, what you see on camera is what you get in person. He's he's authentic as they come, and um, not a lot of not a lot of motivators out there like him. His uh, his pregame speeches will get you fired up and um, you know, he's just, he's a, he's a player's coach. You know, he, he'll sit you down and talk to you and, and tell you, you know, straight to your face what, what he thinks. And I mean, that's, that's how I like my coaches. You know, I want them to be blunt and, and be honest and 
he'll tell you how he wants you to play and what he wants you to do and um, whether he thinks you're playing well or you're not playing well and um, he's uh, he's perfect for that league and he was uh, he was like I said he's a he's a beauty and I'm, I'm happy he was on our side. Yeah, no, certainly. And uh, it's probably a great experience. And it was, I bet it was a lot of fun there. And um, congrats on the win. And you guys did so well. So we're going to get into your team candidates here. I got to ask you, what was the experience like in your first ever game? And how did that feel to wear the Canadian jersey on your chest? Yeah, that would have been 2014 playing in Denver, the, the field nationals. And uh, game one, I think, it was against the U.S. Was So that was a little bit intimidating. Um, they were the defending champions and seeing some of the names on that roster. Um, ended up losing, I think it was 10-7 in the round robin. We lost that game, but uh, pretty awesome. Anytime, anybody that's done it, I'll tell you, anytime you have a chance to, you know, represent your country and, and wear, you know, your country's flag, it's it's a it's a pretty big honor. And um, getting to do it with that, you know, that 2014 team, it was, it was pretty special. And obviously the run that we went on and, be able to win that gold medal it was uh it was awesome you've obviously uh played for Canada four times twice in the box twice in the field uh what are some of the biggest memories that have st- stood out to you uh obviously well the three gold medals getting to that 2014 again that one was was pretty special everybody kind of wrote us off and, and never really gave us a chance um against that you know that stacked American team and um getting to beat them on their their home soil was was pretty special and and again um even the box you know in in Langley this year in in 2019 getting to play again play in front of family and friends you know just down the road from from where I grew up was was pretty awesome as well I you know everybody out to the games and and, you know I grew up 10 minutes down the road so uh but again like I said before anytime you you have a chance to to put on the Maple Leaf and then play for Team Canada is, is pretty special yeah, it definitely is. And especially when you win, it'll it's a memory that will last for a lifetime. So we're going to get into our final piece here. Uh, we do this with everybody. We always ask who your favorite referee is and why, because I'm sure you know it. you've been around the game a long time and there is a lot of abuse towards the officials. And I think we all know without the officials, we don't have a game. So we'll ask you who your favorite referee is and why. Oh, boy. Favorite referee. Um... You know, man, that's tough. That's a tough one. You know, I got to give some respect. Ian Garrison, he's, uh, I'm sure a lot of guys will laugh when they hear that name, but he's, uh, he doesn't take any shit on the floor. And he, uh, you know, if you yell him at the floor, he'll yell right back. He'll chirp you back. And he doesn't take any shit. So um, you got to have a little bit of respect for, for a guy like that. And, um, so if I have to pick one, I'll I'll give Garrison a shout out. Hopefully he watches this and, and takes it easy on me too. Gives me a well, couple calls. That's awesome. We had Jake and I both had Garrison growing up, and uh, you're definitely right when you say he doesn't take any shit. It's uh, it's almost entertaining to a point when he starts kicking people out, especially in the summer game when he can just toss out whoever he wants. Oh, yes. So. It's awesome. Um, yeah, so we appreciate you coming on here and talking with us. Um, wish you the best of luck moving forward with your lacrosse career, and uh, thanks again. No worries, fellas, anytime. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Sticks and Picks Lacrosse Podcast presented by Lacrosse Unlimited. Don't forget to check out their website at lacrosseunlimited.com for all your lacrosse needs. A big thank you to True Lacrosse for their continued support in growing the game of lacrosse through our podcast. True Lacrosse provides lacrosse athletes with top-of-the-line equipment and sticks in today's game. Follow us on our social media pages on Twitter and Instagram at StixPicksLax and on Facebook at Sticks and Picks Lacrosse for more lacrosse content future episode releases, and some awesome lacrosse giveaways. We are currently giving away another True Comp SF 4.0 shaft. Head over to our Instagram page for more details. The 2020 NLL Draft is a week away. Stay tuned to our social media pages for an episode all about the players in this year's draft.